and to talk a little bit about Simon. So, my background, um, I went from ground, um, I went from not doing particularly well at school and university to um, working in sales at Spark, which back when I started was actually Genoi. And uh, the sales sort of was more of the solution side of things. I ended up transitioning into doing a lot of strategy consulting for organisations around their business strategy and cyber strategy, um, which then led me into a CIO role, first with a company called OCS, a um, facilities management company, a family owned business. And I started off as the New Zealand sort of GM of IT and ended up as the regional um, CIO within six months of starting. So my first CIO role was looking after 8,000 staff across New Zealand, Australia, China, Hong Kong and Korea. So I was very much in the deep end and learned a lot about cyber resilience in, in that journey. Uh, soon after that I went to PTO and headed up um, the, the technology practice there as their, as their CIO took them through a major technological cloud migration cyber resiliency program and as a result of having done that and obviously the, um, the market for video is very much that, that mid-market New Zealand, it became very obvious to me that the mid-market was terribly underserved when it came to cyber advice really. Enterprise, very well looked after, mid-market not so much and that really, that really nagged at me. I really wanted to make sure that the mid-market was as secure as enterprise and they were as looked after as enterprise because it's the engine room of our economy. It's where all the wages come from to support our people, to put food on the table and it's really it's really what makes New Zealand great is that, that innovation that comes from the mid-market. So I'm really passionate about that and you'll see from MVP and the way that it's structured uh, once I talk about that a little bit later on exactly, exactly how that came to be. Which led to the partnership with Houston, where Houston have come on board to uh, partner with Minimum Viable Protection as the vehicle for helping to score uh, the cyber posture and provide remediation, cyber remediation advice to uh, everyone in the white cabin. So let's kind of wind back a little bit and talk about cyber. So I kind of like to weave a tax surface into all of my discussions about cyber because it's a really, really important piece of the puzzle that doesn't probably get enough airtime. A little known fact about cyber is that very, very rarely, and I'm talking single digit, low single digit percentage of, the, percentage of the time, is the attack personal. And by personal I mean someone is actively targeting you and trying to attack you. In the industry we call that an APT or an Advanced Persistent Threat Actor. 99% of the time it is a very broad brush approach where uh, bots and uh, all sorts of automated attacks are being used to try and find vulnerabilities fundamentally and that is by far and away the most common attack type. By way of example, previous organisation I used to manage, we had very sophisticated um, sensing technologies around the edge of our business to understand how often we were being attacked and this is a little game I like to play. So we had roughly 15 sites, New Zealand based organisation, throw some numbers at me around how often you think we were getting attacked per day. Come on people, hit me with some numbers. Five. Five? Okay, I'm talking events, not qualified. So 25,000? 25, Any advances on 25,000? 25, 25,000 going once, anyone? A million? Okay, so on average we would get around 36.5 million attack attempts per day on our perimeter. Now, an attack surface is all the attackable objects in an environment. It is fundamentally your IP addresses. That could be a PC, it could be a email address, it could be a web app that you publish to the web, it could be your internet service that you use to browse. Anything that is known or available on the internet is part of your attack surface. The bigger your attack surface is, the harder it is to manage, the more attackable you are and the higher cost it, it takes to secure and maintain it. So the reason I bring this up is if you want to reduce the likelihood of being attacked and the cost of looking after and maintaining your environment from a cyber perspective, reduce your attack surface, turn off old apps, turn off old servers, only present absolutely critical IPs to the outside world that need to be presented 
because you're publishing an app or a service or it's performing a function. So attack surfaces is a really poorly understood concept and it is absolutely critical to managing your uh, cyber footprint and making sure you are less likely to, to suffer an uh, adverse event. Now, by way of that 36.5 million events hitting our perimeter, there would probably be, because we had very good automation technologies in place, two or three events per week that we would care about. And those two or three events would be um, events that looked very malicious, very targeted, that were unusual in the way that they were being perpetrated upon us. And they would cause us to actually dig a little bit deeper and figure out if there's someone having a go or if there's more to that. Of those two or three events a week, we would maybe have one every couple of months that really gave us cause for concern and we'd have to take mitigating um, actions. Most of the time it was something internal that uh, we didn't really know about. Someone had installed a new app on their device without authorization and it was doing something weird inside our network and it looked like a malicious hacker. So the number of real events that occur is very, very low. But if you don't patch, if you don't maintain, if you don't keep your attack surface under control, you are just opening yourself up fundamentally. So, my clock is going to work. That probably leads us into cyber resiliency. Cyber resiliency is different to the way we used to think about cyber protection. Cyber protection and the, and the traditional approach has always been, I've got a firewall, I've got antivirus, I'm good. I have protections in place to keep the baddies out, so therefore I'm fine, aren't I? That was always cyber protection. Cyber resiliency is starting to understand that there's actually more to it than that. Cyber resiliency is around, um, I might not necessarily get hacked, but someone might DDoS my firewall, which basically throws a whole bunch of traffic at your firewall, and it stops the ability for you to communicate to the outside world or receive information from the outside world i.e. if you're a cloud-based business, you're dead in the water. You can't get to Office 365, you can't get to Zero. you can't get to Dropbox, people can't email you, you can't send notifications to your clients to let them know that you're under attack and that, you know, don't talk to me at the moment because I won't get your emails. You're dead. So cyber resiliency is around understanding that there's a little more to it than just putting protections in place. You need alerting, you need monitoring, you need mitigations, you need controls, you need policy, you need procedures, you need a whole suite of responses to a given set of scenarios that you have thought about in advance to ensure that the way that you construct your defences are appropriate to your business type and the kind of attacks that may be perpetrated on you from a, from a cyber perspective. So resilience is a broader discussion than I've got a firewall, I've got antivirus, I'm good. Because it's a little bit deeper than that these days. So all that's good and well, and where the tie-in here to um, you know governance comes in is that it's easy for me to stand up in front of a board of directors and say, you're not very secure, you need to spend lots of money and then you'll be sweet. And most of the time that I've taken that approach when I was back in my sales days, the answer was no. Thank you, but we're fine, thanks. We've got a firewall, we've got antivirus, we're good. And I went through this cycle many times. Um, I worked in MSPs, I worked as a, as, a, as a consultant, I worked as a CIO. And over many years, I developed um, an understanding of why the answer was no more often than it was yes. And what it came down to was, um, in order to govern, you need to be able to measure and manage what it is that you're governing. The language of boards is risk. And risk is quantified and qualified <coughs> in terms of dollars, numbers, and percentages. If you can't explain it in those terms, you'll lose them. Because then it comes down to a knowledge-based discussion or an emotive one. And neither of those carry any favor with the board. So I started to think, if I was a board member and someone was presenting to me a concept that I have no understanding of, what would I need in order to have all of that line up in order for me to make a, a good decision? And as that relates to cyber, where I landed on, on that kind of thought process was you need to understand first and foremost what your risk appetite is. And every organisation has a different risk appetite. You might be an e-commerce organisation and you have to have your systems up and, a, 
available every hour of the day because that's how you trade. Or you could be a manufacturing organisation and you don't care about the outside world, but internally your process systems need to be up and running so that you can manufacture or distribution or financial services or schooling and education. Every organisation has a different profile and a different set of requirements. And fundamentally, those are represented in four key areas. The first one is personally identifiable information, PII. How much of that you hold and how much of that you transact is a key attribute. Revenue. If you get hit by cyber and you can't trade, how quickly will that affect you and how long can you can continue to withstand that? Reputation. If you get hit, will it affect your reputation to a greater or lesser extent? And how long lasting will that effect be? And finally, regulation. Some organisations are very heavily regulated, some aren't. Some are incredibly punitive, some aren't. So those four key attributes, if you score them accurately, and we've got an algorithm that does that, it, it helps you to understand what your risk appetite is, and you can speak to the board in a language that they understand. We are a three out of five for our risk appetite because of these reasons. We are a one out of five because of these reasons, and all of a sudden they start to connect with the story that you're telling. Then we look at what your posture is. Now, we've been, as an industry, scoring cyber posture forever, and there are great big standards that achieve that. There's the ISO standards, there's the NIST um, cybersecurity framework standard, CIS, or Centre for Internet Security, there's a whole bunch of them. We've got ALGIM, which is a local government one, we've got NZISM, there's standards galore out there, but they're all massive, they're huge, and you need to pay stupid amounts of highly paid consulting money for people that understand these things to go through hundreds of controls and fundamentally give you a report that you can't read and doesn't make sense. We needed to fix that for mid-market New Zealand. So we took all of those big standards and we shrunk them down to the 20 controls that mattered the most. And the correlation that I like to make is, if you take your car in for a warrant of fitness, there are 18 sort of areas or domain areas that they assess when you take your car in for a warrant. But Behind those 18 areas, there's a couple of hundred different controls. So if you look at brakes, for example, there's about 15 different controls they check for your brakes. But if you're gonna go on a road trip with your family, what are the three things that you really care about? You wanna make sure your lights work, you wanna make sure your brakes work, and you wanna make sure your windscreen wipers work. Those are probably the three main things. Everything else you can probably deal with later. We took a similar approach to cyber. Of all the thousands of things that you could look at, look at what are the 20 things that matter the most? And if we score those and give people a score that is relative to their um, cyber appetite, all of a sudden the board is starting to understand that there's relativity here. So we did that. There we go. Is it coming through? It's kind of getting chopped off a little bit. And where we landed with it was if we score cyber risk appetite in a way that boards can connect with because it's talking to the PII revenue regulation and reputational risk, and if we score the 20 key domain areas that matter most around how representing how secure an organisation is, and then we serve up a, um, a remediation plan that fundamentally aligns those two, then we have the beginning of a story that a board can connect with. It's, it gives relativity across the scoring. It's focused into areas that make sense to them and they can connect with. It's focusing the remediation plan on the area that matters most to them for a bunch of reasons that they connect with and understand. And it means that they can all of a sudden engage meaningfully in a risk and governance manner to deliver the right outcome for their organisation. Um, four years in, having built this and rolled it out many, many, many times, We've still got a 100% success rate and the board of directors are signing off on the remediation plan. And we've done some very small and some very, very large investigations and remediations. But because it lines up for the board and because it makes sense to them and it's something tangible that they can govern, they connect to it and they tend to go ahead with it. So we're really proud to be partnering with Houston on this journey and we're really excited to, uh, to move forward and take this uh, methodology to the Waikato market and we hope that we can work together to lift the cyber posture in New Zealand and uh, keep that keep that money flowing in all the right ways, not out to ransomware. Uh, thank you very much.